Solar eclipses are cosmic magic tricks during which the moon suddenly swallows the sun. Only they work not on magic, but on simple science. Let's try to find out how exactly they work and how you personally can observe this fascinating event. It all starts when the moon, the sun, and the earth line up in a straight line, with the moon positioned directly between us and our favorite star. This alignment is possible because the Moon's orbit around the Sun is slightly tilted relative to the Earth's orbit around the Sun. Solar eclipses only happen during new moons, when the Moon is closest to the Earth in its orbit. So, when the alignment is just right, the Moon's shadow is cast on the Earth, blocking the sunlight from reaching us. Imagine being in a room with a giant light switch, but instead of turning the light off, you just cover it with a big old moon. That's basically the solar eclipse. Solar eclipses aren't a regular occurrence, and they only happen a few times each year. The frequency of solar eclipses is determined by many things, like the alignment of the Moon, Sun, and Earth, and by the position of the Moon in its orbit around the Earth. Now, there are three main types of solar eclipses – total, partial, and annular. A total solar eclipse occurs when the Moon completely covers the Sun's disk and the sky becomes dark as if it were nighttime. This phase can last for a few minutes to just over an hour, depending on the distance between the Moon and the Earth at the time of the eclipse. A total solar eclipse can only be visible from a specific region on the Earth called the Path of Totality. Ooh. This path is typically a narrow strip of land or sea, and if you happen to be exactly in the right spot, you'll be able to enjoy this wonderful view. Unfortunately, not everyone is so lucky to get to see a total solar eclipse. Sometimes the moon only covers part of the sun. In that case, you'll see a crescent-shaped sun instead of a completely swallowed one. That's called a partial solar eclipse. And if you're really unlucky, the moon might be too far away from the Earth to completely cover the sun. In that case, you'll see a bright ring of sunlight around the moon's silhouette. That's called an annular solar eclipse. Solar eclipses are some of the most spectacular celestial events that we can observe from Earth. People have observed and studied them throughout history, and they've played a significant role in our understanding of the Sun, Moon, and Earth. For example, we use them to measure the size and distance of the Moon and the Sun, to study the solar atmosphere, and to test Einstein's theory of general relativity. Solar eclipses have always been important to people, so it's not surprising that they've always been connected to different myths and superstitions. Some cultures saw them as a sign of dreadful things to come, or a way to talk to their deities. Others thought they could be used to predict the future or scare away evil spirits. All these beliefs show how much solar eclipses have meant to people. There have been many fascinating and memorable solar eclipses throughout history each with its own unique story or significance. Here are a few examples of some of the most mysterious, cool, or just famous solar eclipses. The eclipse of Thales is one of the most famous solar eclipses in history. It's said to have occurred in the year 585 BCE, and it was reportedly predicted by the ancient Greek philosopher Thales of Miletus. According to legend, Thales was able to predict the eclipse by observing the cycles of the moon, and his prediction is said to have amazed and frightened the people of the time. The eclipse of Ptolemy was a total solar eclipse that's said to have occurred in the year 150 CE. It's famous because it's mentioned in the writings of the ancient Greek astronomer Ptolemy. He used his observations of the moon's cycles to make his prediction, which astonished and alarmed people of that time. The eclipse of the century was a total solar eclipse that occurred on July 11, 1991. It was visible across a substantial portion of South America. It was the longest total solar eclipse of the 20th century, lasting for more than six and a half minutes. The eclipse of the pyramids was a total solar eclipse that occurred on March 20, 2015, and it was visible from parts of Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. It got famous because it passed directly over the ancient pyramids of Giza in Egypt, providing a unique opportunity for scientists and tourists to study the eclipse from this historic location. And, of course, the Great American Eclipse of 2017. It was a total solar eclipse that was visible across a large portion of the United States from coast to coast. 
It was the first total eclipse visible from the contiguous U.S. in nearly 40 years, and it attracted millions of spectators and was widely covered by the media. Since they happen quite rarely, you wouldn't want to miss such an event. Fortunately, we have a calendar of solar eclipses that will occur in the next few years. The Great North American Eclipse of 2023, expected to be visible in a substantial portion of North America from the Pacific Northwest to the Great Lakes region. It will be the first total eclipse visible from the United States since the Great American Eclipse of 2017. The Eclipse of the Andes of 2024. This one is expected to be visible across parts of South America, including parts of Chile and Argentina. It will be the first total eclipse visible from South America since the eclipse of the century in 1991. The eclipse of the Arctic in 2025. This one will be visible in the Arctic part of our planet, including parts of Canada and Greenland. It will be the first total eclipse visible from the Arctic in nearly 100 years. And the eclipse of the Pacific in 2026. This eclipse will be visible across parts of the Pacific Ocean, including parts of Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. It's worth noting that the exact timing and visibility of these solar eclipses may change as more precise predictions are made. Also, some other solar eclipses may also occur in the coming years. Don't forget to check the details online. But the most important question is, how do we watch them? The answer? Very carefully. Here's some general tips. Use proper eye protection. Never, never look directly at the sun, even during an eclipse. It's not worth risking your sight. To observe a solar eclipse safely, use things like certified solar eclipse glasses or a pinhole projector. These devices allow you to view the eclipse without looking directly at the sun, and they help protect your eyes from the harmful effects of the sun's rays. Find a good viewing location. To get the best view of a solar eclipse, it's important to find a location that is within the path of the eclipse and has a clear view of the sky. Use a camera or telescope. If you have a camera or telescope with a solar filter, you can use it to take pictures or observe the eclipse more closely. Just be sure to use a solar filter to protect your eyes and equipment. Stay informed. It's important to be up to date about the details of a solar eclipse, including the exact timing, location, and type of eclipse. This information can help you plan your viewing and ensure that you have the proper equipment and safety precautions in place. That's it. Simple, isn't it? By following these tips, you can enjoy observing solar eclipses safely and responsibly. And if you do get to see a solar eclipse, make sure to snap some pics and share them with your friends. Remember, it's a once-in-a-lifetime experience after all. From where we stand, the sun seems so calm and peaceful. But like humans, and basically the whole living world, the sun has its own phases when it's more or less active. It's just that the consequences are way bigger and more chaotic when the sun becomes hyperactive. Let's zoom in to see what's happening up there. So one of the ways we measure the activity of our star is by counting sunspots on its surface. Sunspots are dark patches that form when the sun's magnetic field gets all tangled up. It's simple. The more sunspots, the more active our sun is. And it seems the sun has been partying like crazy recently. The number of sunspots scientists have seen is the highest for nearly 21 years. In June, 163 sunspots appeared on the sun's surface. The last time we had so many dark patches across the sun was in September 2002, when there were 187 of them. Uh-oh. It seems this chaotic party is getting closer to its peak. And that's something we call solar maximum. How does all this even happen? The sun's magnetic field is strong and organized at some point. But as we said, sometimes comes the time when it kind of ends up tangled. Sort of like a ball of rubber bands that are wound together very tightly. This also means plasma is rising from the surface, forming loops, and causing a mess in the shape of solar flares, and something we call coronal mass ejections, CME. That's when plasma in the sun's upper atmosphere, called the corona, goes crazy, and bursts really strong. Then at some point, this ball snaps and completely flips and turns the south pole into the north pole and vice versa. All this happens every 11 years or so, 
So when the sun comes into this phase when it becomes very active, it shoots out hot blobs of plasma, gets big dark spots as large as planets, and releases powerful eruptions of energy and radiation. Something fascinating happens when the sun becomes more active. A thing called plasma waterfall or polar crown prominence, PCP. It's like a mini eruption that starts on the sun, and it seems like it tries to get away, but then the sun's magnetic field pulls it back before it can escape into space. And this plasma waterfall is really spectacular. It goes up to 62,000 miles above the surface. It's like you stack eight Earths on top of each other. Then there's something called a polar vortex. It's like a gigantic halo of plasma that rotates around the sun's north pole really fast. This vortex happens when a large tentacle of plasma snaps apart and falls back toward the surface, similar to how a plasma waterfall forms. Scientists don't know why this plasma stays above the sun's surface for so long. And one of the cool examples of CMEs was a giant one in the shape of a butterfly in March this year. It got such an unusual shape because it exploded on the side of the sun we couldn't see, so it was impossible to fully measure how strong it was. Fortunately, that one didn't explode in our direction, but it might have hit Mercury a little bit. And it's possible it knocked off some dust and gas since Mercury has a weak magnetic field. All this sounds cool in theory, but it's not such good news for us. Because of all this, we might experience more intense solar storms that can, again, lead to geomagnetic storms on Earth. And these don't just sound alarming, they indeed are. They create chaos and disrupt the magnetic field of our planet. Geomagnetic storms can create beautiful northern lights, true. But we'd all rather enjoy such beauties as the aurora borealis in regular conditions, or just watch a good old sunset above the ocean. It's not that every solar storm will necessarily hit Earth, even if there are more of them. To reach our planet, they must be pointed in the right direction at the right moment. But if that happens, the storm can ionize the upper atmosphere and bye-bye our communications. It can cause temporary blackouts for systems such as GPS and radio. It isn't necessarily a big problem on its own, but it can be very dangerous if it happens at the wrong time, like during a tsunami or an earthquake. The storms can also damage electrical infrastructure, like rail lines and power grids. If you're on a plane at that time, you might be exposed to higher levels of radiation. It's still not clear how dangerous that will be for you, but it can be a serious problem for astronauts in space. When solar storms mess with the magnetic field, this can affect the migrations of some animals, such as sea turtles, whales, and birds. Since things in the animal kingdom mostly work in the natural order, who knows how these animals go through or even survive such changes? And when the sun is at a maximum of its activity, satellites in space are in trouble too. We have more satellites in space than ever before. And when the upper atmosphere becomes denser because of all these changes, this can push satellites in different directions. They might crash into one another or some can even fall back to Earth, which again is only cool in movies with superheroes who can relatively easily deal with this stuff. Hopefully, we'll avoid a massive solar storm like the Carrington event. The story was similar. In August 1859, Astronomers across the globe watched how the number of sunspots was getting bigger and bigger. A man named Richard Carrington was among them. At the beginning of September, he was sketching the sunspots when, out of a sudden, he was blinded by a flash of light. It lasted around five minutes, but it was spectacular. He later described it as a white light flare. It was a very strong coronal mass ejection CME, and in only 17.6 hours, this storm crossed the long way between the sun and our home planet, 90 million miles, and unleashed its force on us, even though this usually takes days. And when this storm started, telegraph machines across the world sparked. Operators got electric shocks and paper even caught fire. People were really scared and confused because they had never seen such bright skies before. Some even thought it was the end of the world. The next day, Telegraph workers still couldn't work properly because Earth's atmosphere was still charged. They even managed to send messages using the auroral current instead of regular electricity. But it brought something incredible, two stunning auroras in the sky. People in Hawaii and Cuba could see beautiful northern lights, while those as far north as Chile could see the southern lights. It's all slowly but steadily escalating. Take solar flares, for example. These are powerful bursts of energy from the sun. 
In 2022, there were five times more of these flares compared to the previous year. Plus the strongest ones, X-Class flares, have been getting stronger and more common than before too. And this might be way more extreme than anyone thought. Plus, it's likely to start a little bit earlier than we predicted. Scientists first thought the peak would happen in 2025, but it seems it could even occur by the end of 2023. We can't completely protect ourselves if a solar storm hits us directly, but we can still do some things like ground planes, adjust the paths of satellites in space, and try to make sure vulnerable infrastructure stays safe. To do all this, we need better solar weather forecasts to help us get ready for the worst. All this might sound very bad at first, but don't worry, solar flares won't destroy our planet. They do send charged solar material toward us at pretty high speeds, but it's not like we're completely doomed if these things hit us. Our planet won't leave us unprotected. We still have the atmosphere and magnetic field that keep us relatively safe. Our thick atmosphere is like a shield that blocks radiation that might harm us. So these solar flares can mostly affect technology, but they won't destroy Earth. I guess we have our own superheroes after all. Let's face it, as stars go, our sun is actually, well, pretty boring. Come on, there's nothing unusual about it. There are millions of similar yellow dwarfs in the universe. And yet, we love it. After all, it's the only star we have, and it gives us life. However, it wasn't always like that. Once upon a time, the sun had a twin, possibly an evil one. Hmm, <laughs> What happened to it? Well, let's find out. Now this here is a giant molecular cloud. They're also sometimes called dark nebula. Here, there are many interstellar clumps full of gas, dust, and piles of stars. These clouds have no clear boundaries and often take weird, crazy forms. You can even see some of them with the naked eye. Look at the clear sky at night. They look like dark spots all across the bright Milky Way. And this is exactly where our sun was born about 4.5 billion years ago. The sun originated from one of these molecular clouds. Billions of years ago, waves of energy were passing by here. They collected all this material and compressed these clumps into dense nuclei. That's when a protostar was born. This young protostar was a ball of lukewarm hydrogen and helium. And then, millions of years later, the temperature and pressure inside the balls increased. As a result, a star was born. The sun. But not everything in this molecular cloud has turned into the sun. The remaining materials began to revolve around the new star. And, as you might have guessed, they gradually turned into planets, including our Earth. This is how our solar system was created. But it's quite possible that this is not the whole story. And that at the same time, along with our star, another one was born. The lost twin of the Sun, made from the same materials under the same conditions. But why do we think that it exists? Well, recently, scientists have launched some statistical models to find out more about the birth of stars. And these models have shown that many stars appear not individually, but in clusters, or at least with one sibling. After more research, scientists confirmed that, yep, most stars formed inside molecular clouds are born with a companion. Sometimes these companions stay together. For example, a small star will revolve around a large one. They can even form double, triple, and other star systems. And sometimes, their paths may diverge forever. This probably happened to our sun as well. It could have had a sibling too. Perhaps not even one, but a whole cluster of little brothers and sisters. And one bigger twin with a similar mass and other characteristics. But if that's the case, then where are you, our lost twin? Well, we have one hypothesis, and according to it, this twin may not be as good as it seems. In the 1980s, scientists began to notice a certain pattern in the Earth's history. Approximately every 27 million years, give or take, large-scale extinctions occurred on our planet. Pretty strange, right? Every 27 million years in the history of Earth, some kind of catastrophe occurred that changed its biosphere forever, as if something, as scheduled, cyclically, caused them. Then an astronomer, Richard Muller, suggested that there may be something that caused the events, a certain celestial body. According to him, it could be a dwarf star that we can't see because of how dim it is. It could be located about one and a half light years away from us. This star rotates around the Sun in a huge orbit, 
and it approximately takes a whopping 27 million years for it to finish its orbit. And when it gets closest to the Sun, it starts to cause complete chaos. While approaching us, this troublemaker changes the trajectories of comets in the Oort cloud or the Kuiper belt. As a result, all these comets start to rush straight toward us. Then they crash into the Earth and cause mass extinctions, just like it was with dinosaurs. This hypothetical star was named Nemesis. It's the name of the ancient Greek deity of retribution. What is it taking revenge on us for? No idea. Perhaps it didn't like the fact that, once upon a time, the sun took away almost all the dust and gas from a molecular cloud. The sun became a fairly large star, but the twin remained dark and small. Moreover, in the end, it was forced to fly away in the middle of nowhere. Anyone would be annoyed by something like this. Scientists have put forward various hypotheses about what the mysterious nemesis is. Perhaps it's a brown or red dwarf. The remnants of a star that has completely depleted its fuel. Or maybe it's not a star at all, but a rogue planet more gigantic than Jupiter. Well, whatever it is, its existence isn't particularly pleasant for us. However, all our attempts to find the culprit unfortunately fail. At the moment, we still haven't found any signs of Nemesis. Recent studies have called into question the theory of regular mass extinctions. If you look more into fossil records, you'll notice that these catastrophes occurred rather randomly, rather than on a clear schedule. Now scientists doubt if Nemesis may actually exist. They also say that any star moving in a similar orbit would be very unstable, and it's very unlikely that it could have survived for that long. But despite the lack of clear evidence, Nemesis had become quite famous online. Many articles and news still mention it in different contexts. They like to write off any dramatic events taking place in the world, like asteroid falls, tsunamis, and so on, on this mysterious star. So now, all this may seem like a typical urban legend. But let's not forget about something important. Even if Nemesis itself doesn't exist, it doesn't mean that the Sun didn't have a twin. Cool. 
We've sent more spacecraft to study the local environment on Mars than on any other planet. We have no evidence that life exists on the Red Planet, or ever did. But that didn't stop some people from wondering. Mostly because of the pictures that NASA's Perseverance and Curiosity rovers take regularly of Mars' surface. Feel free to check them out for yourself on the Internet. They are free for anyone to see. Over time, some odd shapes have appeared here and there in these pictures, making some people believe there is some sort of creatures living there already. Back in 2008, one of the rovers took a picture of a rock that looked very much like a female figure. Other photos seem to show animal-shaped figures, utensils or other Earth-like objects. Again, there is little to no proof of this theory, as rocks can be of all sorts of shapes and sizes. But if you look at the pictures, it does make you wonder. A lot of people in the scientific community do see Mars as a better place for long-term settlements, even though our moon is closer. Firstly, because it believed there is indeed water on Mars. It's just stuck in underground frozen lakes. The soil doesn't seem to be rich in nutrients, and it may have some harmful chemicals. Moreover, on the Red Planet, the gravitational pull is only 38% of Earth's, so it's easy to carry heavy objects here. On our Moon, for comparison, the gravitational force is only about 16 and 16 percent of that found on Earth. We already have people studying how we might live on Mars right here on our planet. It's because certain regions of Earth closely mimic the harsher conditions on Mars. Daven Island, for example, is the biggest uninhabited island on our planet, located in the Canadian Arctic archipelago. It's easy to see why it's hard to live here. The soil stays frozen all year. The eastern part of the island is covered by a thick ice cap all year round. Summers here only last for less than 50 days and aren't really that warm. Not a lot of plants can grow here, so no animals can adapt to thrive and multiply. As such, the Hutton Mars project started here in 1997 to offer astronauts unique studying opportunities. There are few options here in terms of logistics and transportation, and communicating with people living outside the island is also a bit more difficult. All because of the temperature and barren soil. Think about it, if we can find solution to live here, we might be able to do it on Mars too. Regardless of our local training, the conditions on Mars are currently inhospitable. That's because it's really cold. On average, the temperature is about minus 81 Fahrenheit. Even during the summertime, it's never hotter than 86 Fahrenheit. And to top it all off, the planet's atmosphere is made of 95 and 3 tenth percent carbon dioxide, so there's literally no way we could breathe there without special devices. Mars also lacks a magnetic field on its surface, so it is attacked by the sun's radiation. Because of the temperature variations, Mars often experiences powerful dust storms, which can surround the entire planet. Technically, these storms can physically harm us, but the dust might clog electronics and render solar-powered instruments unstable. We know now that life as we know it is impossible on Mars, but did it ever exist there? This is a question long debated by scientists, since NASA's investigations have determined that some parts of Mars were habitable at one point. We don't know for how long or how far back, and just because something could have lived there, it doesn't mean it actually did. Other recent photos from Mars showed a cloudy sunset. Does that mean it also rains on the Red Planet? Well, not really. For starters, on our planet clouds are water vapors, and once it starts to rain, the water reaches the surface of our planet in liquid form. This process isn't the same on Mars. Surprisingly, there is more water in Mars clouds, but they are made of iced water. Think of them as a tiny icy fog. Combined with the thin atmosphere and cold temperatures, it keeps the clouds from ever falling to the surface. Sunsets are different here too. According to NASA specialists, there is some fine dust that makes the blue near the sun's part of the sky much more visible on Mars, so the sunsets here have more of a bluish tint. Similar to Earth, Mars is also tilted on its axis, which means it also has seasons. 
Because the southern hemisphere is directed away from the sun when Mars is farthest from it, the winters here are far colder and summers way hotter. Calendars work differently on Mars too. A year here lasts for about 1 and 8800 Earth years. A day is a bit more longer than 24 hours. Even if we were to ever move to Mars, we'd still have to communicate with our Earth. It would be a bit difficult to do, since a message sent back home would take about 15 minutes to reach its destination. It's not that bad, given the entire distance, but it would make video calls kind of annoying. As difficult as it might be for now to live there, there is a lot of stuff to see. Some scientists believe that if we were completely colonized Mars, a list of locations would soon be declared national parks, like the area surrounding Olympus Mons, which is the biggest known volcano in the solar system, stretching over 16 miles. Valles Marineris would be another cool location, it's been a huge complex of valleys about the distance from Los Angeles to New York. Mars also has some cool polar ice caps, which sometimes experience dry ice snowfall. Saturn and Uranus are unique planets in our solar system because of their rings. It may not have one now, but Mars may be getting a ring of its own in the future. Don't get too excited, it's estimated it might take 10 of millions of years. Mars' largest moon, named Phobos, will be torn apart at one point. The debris resulting from it will settle in a rocky ring around Mars, resembling that of Saturn and Uranus. Speaking of moons, Mars has two of them, that we know of. Apart from Phobos, there is also one more object called Deimos. Both were discovered by an American astronomer named Days of Hull back in 1877. The scientist had almost given up his pursuit to find Mars moons. But thankfully, he was urged to continue the project. The next night he stumbled upon Deimos. Six days after that initial finding, Hall found Phobos. These two space objects may be in fact some asteroids captured by Mars gravity. Another theory suggests they formed in orbit around Mars at about the same time the planet came to be. The fact that Mars has a really weak gravity may also be the reason for this fascinating event. Mars was hit by large asteroids many years ago, just like our planet was. A lot of that debris surely went back to the surface, but some of it was ejected back into space, as Mars' gravity wasn't strong enough to pull them back. They had quite a journey, some of them even ended up on Earth. These pieces of Mars also helped us understand the planet's unique features. We've continued to send robots to the Red Planet quite successfully in the past few decades. But it still remains quite difficult to imagine people will soon land on Mars. Even considering the current rocket technology, the journey would take us six months. And that's an optimistic scenario, given everything goes well on board. After landing, humans will be exposed to deep space radiation and microgravity. Both of these have serious effects on the human body, which we've yet to figure out how to counteract. That's why research is continuously performed on the International Space Station regarding the long-term effects of microgravity. So, what's going on with all the news about the sun? Some say that the sun is getting angry. Well, what does that mean exactly, and should we be concerned? Frankly, yes, we should be concerned. It's generally not a good thing to get too much sunshine. The ultraviolet component of sunlight is harmful to the skin. That's why humans have adapted a spectrum of skin pigmentation. The more sunlight there is to protect ourselves against, the more pigmentation we need. Big floppy hats and, of course, bottles of high SPF oil-free sunscreen help too, especially for fair-skinned people. But what is planet Earth going to do? First, let's get a good estimate of just how angry the sun is likely to get. The sun usually goes through an active calm active cycle every 22 years, with highs and lows occurring every 11 years. Why that happens, no one knows, it just does. There's probably a reason, but scientists haven't figured it out yet. They do know that, with each cycle, the sun reverses its magnetic poles. That in itself is pretty astounding, especially when you consider that Earth hasn't reversed its magnetic poles in the last 600,000 years. Lately, the sun has been extremely calm, the calmest it's been in over a hundred years, in fact. That's unusual, too. 
the active calm active cycle has turned into an active calm calm cycle. But that's changing, and it's why we are notifying brightsiders about what to expect in the coming few years. The terms calm or active or angry refer to the amount of high-energy radiation that the sun gives off. Thankfully, the amount of visible light the sun gives off doesn't change very much. That would be a serious problem. If the sun were to get just 6% dimmer or brighter, the Earth would either freeze or fry. Observing sunspots is the easiest way to measure how active the sun is. The more sunspots that are visible, the more active the sun is. A graph, known as the butterfly diagram, tracks the 11-year period of sunspot activity. The butterfly diagram shows how sunspots disappear regularly from the surface of the sun and reappear regularly in other locations. NASA predicted that the present cycle of solar activity would be calm, like the previous one. But it's starting to look like that is not the case. Presently, we are in solar cycle number 25. That's the 25th 11-year solar cycle since 1755, when record-keeping began. This cycle of solar activity is expected to peak in 2025. The sun has already exceeded the number of sunspots NASA had predicted. So, it doesn't look like this solar cycle is going to be a calm one. It looks like we are going to have some very active sun-blasting radiation on Earth for the next several years. In early February 2022, 40 out of 49 SpaceX communication satellites in orbit above the atmosphere were destroyed by an explosion on the sun. High-speed electromagnetic plasma gas from the sun, known as solar wind, caused the Earth's atmosphere to compress and Elon Musk's satellites lost their orbital integrity and crashed back into Earth. Sunspots look like dark spots on the sun, but they aren't dark. They're just not as bright as the surface of the sun. To get a better idea, take a lit 25-watt light bulb and hold it in front of a lit 100-watt light bulb. The 25-watt light bulb will appear dark. That's the same way it is with sunspots. Sunspots on the surface of the sun almost always come in pairs. This is because sunspots are magnetic storms in the plasma gas of the sun. One sunspot will be magnetic positive, and the other sunspot will be magnetic negative. Between the two sunspots, which can be many times bigger than the Earth itself, there flows an electric current that carries a fiery arc of ionized gas with it. Solar flares are something else we should be concerned about. They are powerful electromagnetic explosions on the sun associated with sunspots. As the super-hot plasma gas on the sun churns and twists, it also twists the magnetic field lines in the sunspots. When these lines snap, a powerful explosion releases X-ray and gamma radiation at the speed of light. Visible gases are also released. Solar flares have a classification system, according to how powerful they are. X-class solar flares are the most dangerous. This type of solar flare can cause radio blackouts across Earth and harm satellites, astronauts in orbit, and even passengers on high-altitude airplanes. M-class solar flares cause spectacular aurora at the North and South Pole areas on Earth, while C-class solar flares have almost no effect on Earth. But solar flares are not the biggest explosions on the sun. CME stands for coronal mass ejection, and these are much more massive than solar flares and more dangerous when they're headed our way. As the name indicates, coronal mass ejections are explosions that originate on the sun's corona. They hurl millions of tons of hot ionized gases outward from the corona. The word corona is derived from the Latin word for crown, and it's the layer of thin bright gas around the sun's surface. The corona of the sun is much hotter than the surface of the sun. The surface itself is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but the corona is somewhere between 1 to 2 million degrees. The why and how the corona is so much hotter than the surface of the sun is another major mystery that scientists have yet to completely work out. A recent theory claims the corona is heated by sound waves and the sun's nuclear reactions make a lot of noise. Project GONG, which stands for Global Oscillation Networking Group, was set up on Earth to monitor the sound waves on the sun. Cool, huh? Turns out the sun is ringing or oscillating like a bell. And we have five observation sites across the globe. One in India, Australia, one in the Canary Islands, one in Chile, and one in California. 
they keep a constant watch over the 10 million sound waves moving on and around the sun. Now that the sun is entering an active phase, we can expect to see more powerful CMEs heading our way. The gases expelled by the sun are ionized and stripped of electrons by the intense heat. This causes them to form a proton storm that can travel through space at speeds of around 500 miles per second. These positively charged atomic nuclei will mostly be blocked or deflected by the magnetic field that extends around Earth. Our atmosphere is no help against a proton storm, although the last mile of air above the surface of the Earth stops the harmful X-rays from solar flares. The particle wind from the Sun can only be stopped by Earth's magnetosphere. We can look forward to some spectacular aurora around Earth's magnetic poles, and it's very possible that these aurora will extend down to the mid-latitudes when the Earth is moving through a coronal mass ejection. Currently, the United States has a space probe headed for the solar corona. Because the corona of the sun extends outward for many millions of miles, the Parker Solar Probe, as it's called, is cruising 3.8 million miles from the surface of our star, or about one-tenth the distance to Mercury. The probe is experiencing temperatures of 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit, but it is also kept at perfect room temperature. A 4.5-inch thick carbon composite heat shield protects the telescopes and magnetometers in the probe that measure the intensity of the solar wind. The five antennae that protrude into the coronal gases are made of a niobium alloy, which can withstand the extreme temperatures of the corona. The recent double-calm cycle of the sun is a bit concerning when trying to predict how active the sun will get this cycle. The sunspots completely disappeared for a long time from the entire surface of the sun. It is as if the magnetic distortions we usually see on the photosphere of the sun had collapsed into its interior. Intense magnetism is coming to the surface now and breaking through into the corona. The National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, is predicting that this solar cycle, cycle number 25, will be one of the strongest ever. The last solar cycle was very calm, with a sunspot count of only 116. The average is 170. But the prediction for this cycle is between 210 and 260 sunspots, which would be one of the strongest cycles ever. We stand to lose more satellites to a stronger solar wind. We can also expect electric grid overloads as the proton storm peaks in 2025. That means we should expect an interruption to our internet services as positively charged protons get into the wires, run into the transformers, and overload them. On March 12, 1989, a powerful CME hit Earth and created absolute havoc with our power grids. Will we experience anything of this magnitude in the near future? Well, stay sharp, bright siders. Venus has exceptionally high temperatures, hot enough to melt lead. It's the hottest planet in our solar system, with a high-pressure environment and super strong winds. The winds there are 50 times faster than the planet's rotation. It's getting stronger over time, and scientists don't know why. But they did find something interesting in the planet's clouds, a potential sign of decaying biological matter. Could there be life then? Not quite, since Venus has a dry, windy atmosphere and doesn't have enough water for life to develop. Rings around other planets are more common than we thought. Saturn's rings are the most famous and spectacular ones. They partially consist of reflective, sparkly water ice, and you can't see anything like that in the rest of our solar system. Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune have ring systems too. And those most likely consist of dust and rocky particles. And not just planets, astronomers found out rings were around one asteroid as well. Speaking of rings, why do you think that Earth doesn't have them? Gas giants have rings, while the rocky ones don't. Two theories explain how rings form. They could be the remains from the times when planets were forming. Or they could be leftover material of an impact that destroyed an unknown moon. Or gravity broke apart this moon of its parent planet. It's not clear why only the gas planets have rings. They formed in the outer area of our solar system, while rocky planets only in its inner circles. May be a good clue. Maybe these inner rocky planets had just better protection from strong impacts that could have formed rings. Also, there are more moons in the outer solar system. 
and there are more rings there. Another thing may be that bigger planets have a bigger volume, so a ring system can remain stable there. Some theories even say that Earth used to have a ring system. A long, long time ago, our planet collided with a Mars-sized object, which most likely resulted in a dense ring of particles and debris. But our story was a bit different than the outer planets. And those rings probably combined and formed the Moon. Do we know the shape of the universe? Einstein had a theory of general relativity. It said that the universe could be in one of these three forms, closed like a sphere, open like a saddle, or flat like a piece of paper. Its shape determines whether it's infinite or not, and whether it will expand forever or maybe collapse at some point. The shape of the universe depends on its density and rate of expansion. One of the best ways to determine its shape is to use something called the cosmic microwave background. It's the relic afterglow, something that's left of the Big Bang. Sound waves that were moving through the universe in its early stages produced quite small spatial variations in the temperature of its faint light. The result of these studies show that the universe probably expands in all directions, which means it's flat. How come our sun is hot while the moon is cold? The sun gives off heat because its core is extremely hot. In there, the pressure is pretty high. The hydrogen turns into helium. That's how the sun creates light and heat. The solar light and heat are enough to light up our days on Earth, as well as support life here, even though the sun is around 93 million miles away from us. The moon is not hot because it doesn't have an atmosphere, so it can't absorb sunlight as our planet does. Its surface gets very hot in the daytime, about 210 degrees Fahrenheit, but since there's no atmosphere, the temperature drops extremely during the night to negative 279 degrees Fahrenheit. The sun is hot, no doubt there, but the space around it is very cold. Heat is the energy object store inside of it. Temperature is how we measure if something is hot or cold. So when you transfer heat to certain objects, its temperature goes up take it away, and the temperature goes down. You can transfer heat in three different ways. Convection, conduction, and radiation. Convection works within gases and liquids, and conduction is for solids. The temperature only affects matter. Space doesn't have enough particles. It's nearly a complete vacuum, which means transferring heat is not effective. The only way to do it is through radiation. When the heat coming from the sun falls on an object in the form of radiation, the atoms that make up that object will absorb energy. This energy moves the atoms and makes them produce heat throughout this process. In space, temperatures of the objects stay the same for a long time. Cold objects stay cold, and hot ones stay hot. If you place anything outside of the Earth's atmosphere and expose it to direct sunlight, the sun will heat it to about 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Objects in outer space that surround our planet and don't receive sunlight directly are at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature is like this because there are molecules that escape our atmosphere, so the sun heats them. We used to think that water was really rare in space, but now we know there's water ice across our entire solar system. For starters, you can usually find water on asteroids and comets. It's also in craters on Mercury and the Moon that are in permanent shadows. On Mars, you'd find ice at its poles, under the surface dust and in frost. It might not be enough to support human colonies up there, but it's still something. Some other bodies in our solar system also contain ice, like the dwarf planet Ceres and one of Saturn's moons. Europa, one of Jupiter's moons, could be one of the most likely candidates we know about that could contain life. It probably has an entire ocean under its frozen and cracked surface. It could have twice as much water as all oceans on our planet together. Titan, the biggest of Saturn's moons, also has a liquid cycle, but it's not water. Its cycle moves materials between the surface and the atmosphere. At first, it sounds like the water cycle we have on Earth. But immense lakes on Titan are filled with ethane and methane. There's a chance they're over a layer of water. 
Neptune is about 30 times as far from the Sun as we are. Of course, it gets significantly less light and heat than Earth, but it also radiates way more heat than it's generating. There are more things happening in its atmosphere, especially if you compare it to its neighbor, Uranus. Uranus is closer to the Sun, but it still radiates the same amount of heat as Neptune. The winds on Neptune are insanely strong, 1,500 miles per hour. No one still knows why. It could be a gravitational contraction, energy coming from its core, or the sun. I hope we'll eventually find out. Can you imagine hot ice? It exists just 33 light years away from us, on one exoplanet. This planet consists of different water elements and they form burning ice. The ice there is solid because of pressure, but the surface temperatures are extreme and go up to 570 degrees Fahrenheit. That's how the water stays super hot and comes off as steam. Picture putting ice in your coffee when you want to heat it up. When you stargaze, it's almost like you're looking into the past. Stars are really far away and it takes longer for their light to reach our planet so it's possible some of them have already run out of fuel and aren't alive anymore. The Pillars of Creation are a good example. This is part of a region 7,000 light years away from us called the Eagle Nebula. These are clouds of gas and dust in the shape of pillars. Scientists first discovered it in 1995, but in reality, a supernova explosion destroyed these pillars that were at least 6,000 years ago. So, the 1995 image shows these pillars from 7,000 years ago. Mars has the biggest volcano in the solar system that we know of so far. It's bigger than the whole state of Hawaii, and 100 times larger than the biggest volcano on Earth. The red planet seems so quiet, but once upon a time, large volcanoes dominated its surface. Volcanoes on the red planet can probably grow so big because gravity there is a lot weaker than down on Earth. Also, the crust on our planet is moving all the time, and the Martian crust probably stays still. You're driving to your sister's house when all of a sudden the sky changes. The cool weather becomes scorching hot in a matter of minutes. People who were going for casual autumn strolls have now taken off their jackets and are sweating. People who were planning on going for a weekend ski trip have canceled their plans at the last minute to head to the beach. It was sunset, but the sky has become as bright as day. You fish out your sunglasses and continue driving. Nothing seems normal, but people don't seem to care. You put on the radio and hear everyone panicking about the sun. Nothing is cohesive. They're jumbling up their words and saying a gazillion things at the same time. You take out your phone and see what's happening on social media. And it's all the same thing. Nothing is comprehensible. It's just people talking about how the sun is getting closer to the earth. Footsteps are clacking along a quiet hallway. A man dressed in a sharp suit is making his way to one of the most important meetings of his life. Adam walks through the meeting room while everyone is waiting to hear what he has to say. As the head astrophysicist, it's Adam's responsibility to figure out what is happening and not let the public know what's going on. Otherwise, the whole world will succumb to panic and mass hysteria, which won't be good. He takes a seat at the head of the table while everyone waits for what he has to say. The room is tense and no one is saying a word. He takes off his glasses and places them on the table. Everyone is watching his every move. He takes a few files out of his folder and starts reading. His voice can command a room. My fellow colleagues, I'm afraid the worst has fallen on us. After countless hours of consistent observation and analysis, we have discovered that a piece of the sun has abandoned its orbit and it's making its way toward us. We still don't know which part of the sun, but we know that once it strikes us, we may not have an Earth to call home any longer. The tension in the room is palpable. Everyone looks at each other confused. Adam answers as many questions as he can, but he himself doesn't even have some of the answers. In a matter of minutes, the press leaks some voice recording of Adam's speech, and the world goes berserk. Back to you. You just heard a snippet from Adam's speech and aren't too convinced of its validity. Even though the sky is getting brighter by the second, there's still no reason to panic. You continue driving, 
and suddenly you sense an intense vibration. Your car lifts off the ground and the windows shatter. You get out and duck for cover. You saw a comet-like object strike down in the middle of nowhere, miles away. More of these objects look like they're heading toward the ground. You start your car and drive off, trying to find a place to hide. Ashes start covering the sky, which makes it even hotter than it already is. The earth is scorching. Meanwhile, traffic is piling up for people who want to escape, but don't have any real place to hide. You eventually abandon your car and go on foot, trying to find a place to cool down and get away from the sun's rays. Even though ash is covering the sky, the sun is still blasting through it. You head to the woods and find a cave to cool down in. It's still hot, but at least you can calm down and figure out your next move from there. You get out your phone and try to see if there's any news updates on what's happening. But nothing seems to be updating. You keep refreshing it, but nothing works. Suddenly, you hear some people getting closer, and they order you to step outside of the cave. Adam is with the top scientists in the world, trying to figure out a solution. Everyone is presenting him with solutions, but in the end, none of them are achievable. They've spent hours in the office, but with each passing minute, the sun is getting stronger and the sky is getting brighter. It feels like nothing can be done until Adam has an aha moment. He calls for everyone's attention and asks for the extra people who are not contributing to leave the room. He mentions that they need to launch a rocket into space that can divert the large mass heading toward the Earth before it breaches the atmosphere. They only have a few hours before the sky becomes completely dangerous and unsuitable for flying. As for now, all flights around the world have been canceled. There is only a small window of opportunity to get this rocket out there and save the world. Adam summons the best engineers he can find to adjust the rocket and the astronauts who will volunteer for the mission. They go into quick basic training and start planning for the next steps. After many briefings, they're ready, but they only have one shot at diverting the large object. The astronauts are ready and begin to enter the rocket. Suddenly, you pop up out of nowhere, dressed in a spacesuit. You're one of the prominent astronauts for the mission. Those people who found you in the cave were from NASA, trying to recruit you for the mission. You meet with Adam, and he quickly briefs you about your role. Because the mission is very last minute, there wasn't even time for Adam to sit with you and give you the proper training or brief. You enter the rocket and take your seat. The engineers and scientists gather around to make sure that everything is in order before takeoff. The large object is getting closer, and if the rocket is delayed, then it'll melt when it reaches the final part of the mission. You're strapped in, and the rocket starts rattling. All systems are in order. Three, two, one, blast off. The rocket picks up and shoots into the sky. There are extra layers of visor shield protection since it feels like you're getting closer to the sun. After a few minutes, the rocket leaves the Earth's atmosphere and is at the forefront of the large object. The rocket suspends itself in a certain strategic position, waiting for the right time to swat the object out of the Earth's trajectory. Meanwhile, everyone back on Earth is hiding in bunkers when the loose debris strikes. A cleanup team will be ready to get rid of the space rocks that will be scorching hot. The bunkers are equipped with food, water, and electricity in case they have to remain underground for a while. Only a few minutes left until the moment comes. You press a button and get ready to deploy a large spike that's as long as the Statue of Liberty. The spike is kept on a stand that's attached to the rocket. It will fire the spike like a bow and arrow and shoot it straight through the large object, breaking it before it melts. There's less than one minute before impact. The arrow is stretched and released. The tip of the arrow has a titanium drill that will continue drilling through the object as soon as it hits. The arrow is released and shoots through space, breaking little pieces of space objects along the way. As it speeds through, it finally hits the large object and drills through it. But nothing seems to be happening. The drill is barely getting through the center. Luckily, Adam had already thought of a backup plan. The rocket, still suspended in its spot, fires a laser where the spike is to speed things up. The laser starts melting through to get to the core. 
The object is getting closer and is speeding up. The object still hasn't broken into pieces yet. Less than two minutes until impact and everyone is running out of options. Adam has one last trick up his sleeve. He orders everyone to evacuate the rocket and move to the backup pods. He wants to put the rocket on a straight collision course with the large object. There's too much confusion. Everyone, including you, quickly heads to the pods and ejects to a safe distance. These pods won't float around in space since they have pressurized air that allows the pods to move in whatever direction the driver wants. Everyone shoots out of the rocket while it goes full speed at the object. They're both going, heading for each other at full speed. There are only a few seconds until impact. The whole world is watching. This rocket is now the only hope there is to save everyone on Earth. The rocket starts melting before impact, and suddenly, a large shockwave ripples through the sky. The rocket was able to break the large object into many pieces. The problem now is the smaller debris falling onto Earth. But since everyone is in bunkers, they're safe. Adam and his colleagues celebrate. You and the rest of the astronauts are safe and make it safely back to Earth. The next phase for everyone on Earth is to rebuild everything that was destroyed. People will have to start everything from scratch. But this is only the beginning of a new chapter in life.